I think that data in Salesforce and the way that that's organized is going to be one of the most critical pieces because that's something that we need to build on from there. So I would say my philosophy is that there's always a better way to do something. Um, and I think that's something that was like an intrinsic value that I've had for a long time and without really realizing it. Um, I know like doing things around the house or doing something like at school, I would always be like, okay, this is like, you know, we're going to be doing like this project, but this seems really tedious. Like, let's just try to find a better way to do it. And, you know, there are some times when I spend maybe probably more time finding a better way to do something. And sometimes it doesn't work, you know, it's not always possible, but there were so many times when I would just like try to make something a little bit better. And I didn't quite have like the engineer mind of wanting to like rework something and make it different, but building on something that already existed and then trying to make it better. Um, and I remember being thinking like as like a college student, like, oh, this would be really cool if this was a job, but like no one's gonna hire me to just like fix things that happen there. Um, and so, yeah, so I, you know, I just kind of fell into ops. Like, I think that's something that it meshes pretty well with like my personality and how I operate on a regular basis. Like I just like am in a mode to want to make things better, make things more efficient and also make them work for people. Because I mean, at the very basic level, like it's humans are sellers and, you know, people are trying to do these processes. So if they're really difficult and um, they're challenging, like people aren't going to want to do them and they're not going to be happy. And it's cool to have that impact on like a group of folks. So you're, you're a change maker, a builder and an, an, a natural in it. Uh, iterator <laughs> yeah i guess you could say that <laughs> yeah awesome um one very interesting thing right is coming into a new organization and being this change maker or this this iterator right um there's often loads of stuff to do especially in SaaS or tech or something um high growth um so where do you start like how do you go about finding out what needs fixing first and actioning that yeah, no, that's honestly something that we're going through right now. So I'm on the latter half of my third week at Concord. Um, so still very, very new, but I feel like I've, you know, had a really um, been very fortunate to have a good group of people to like help me get my feet wet and get like fully acclimated to everything that they have going on. And honestly, just being exposed to the problems, I feel like is such a big piece of that because it's easy to say, okay, here are the things that we're trying to fix, but um, as I'm sure you know, from like an ops perspective, it's like, here's the problem, but are there other problems that are maybe causing that? Are there other issues that maybe coincide with that? Like, what are the bigger picture that we're trying to solve for here? And so part of that is just every time I see something now, I put it like into an Asana board and I have like all these different tasks, like religiously, where I just like jot something down or I, I have a notebook, like a pen and paper, and I just like will constantly be writing something if something comes to mind of like, hey, here's how we fix this or here's anything that I need to focus on because um, I don't want to lose my train of thought for what I'm currently doing. But I also don't, I don't want that to like pass, you know, I don't want to say, okay, I thought of this possible solution or this, even this just an issue and I have no idea how to solve it right now. Um, but we need to do something with it. And so, yeah, so I, um, I try to do that a lot. I try to make sure that things are very organized and then I've just been meeting, you know, with my manager and just understanding like, okay, what are the priorities for the business? What do I think are probably going to just be some of the easier things to fix that could be a couple of hours, like, I mean, it's there, there's so many different facets of it. Um, right now, however, I would say I'm focusing on things that are like the foundation of what I would like to do. And so from my perspective, that is data. Um, I think that data in Salesforce and the way that that's organized is going to be one of the most critical pieces because that's something that we need to build on from there. And so for us, um, making sure that we have like everything in Salesforce is, you know, completely usable, it makes sense, everyone understands what each field means, um, things like that, which are, you know, really simple and foundational pieces of information, but making sure that we all get it really, really well um, is something I think that's like the critical piece of that. And so like cleanups and making sure things are organized and all that really fun stuff that, you know, it's just like a big overhaul. And it's usually something, and especially at other organizations where it's just like, okay, we'll do this like in the future, like we'll get this done. Um, and I was really eager to come in to say, okay, let's just do this right now. So we don't have to then make updates in the future and we can just like clean this stuff up as it is and then move on from there. Um, and I think that's going to yield some really cool results. And I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, hopefully things really start to improve in the future and um, 
we just get better because we we have the the foundation and the structure set for that from the get-go mm -hmm. and and data by the way is a really interesting piece because tied to that are cultures um mm -hmm. how people behave and processes the, the things that guide that behavior and it's it's interesting being a new person in a new leadership role in a new business and you're you're tackling those cultures and so how do you go about navigating that where do you push where do you pull back where do you make suggestions how do you do it um in an astute way i suppose yeah um so i i like to think about my first couple of weeks and my my husband put this really well as like a listening tour um of just like i'm trying to not make any recommendations and trying to just you know introduce myself talk about you know what i'm doing um and what my goals are but like just really listening to everybody else and what they're doing um and i think that that's a really critical piece to understanding because people have their issues. They obviously know so much more about the business than I do even at this point. Um, and I wanna know like what their issues are and what they're facing. And so I think part of our job that's really interesting is that there's like a technology aspect of it, but there's also the human aspect of it and making sure that those are merged together and that, you know, yes, the technology runs well, but do people like it? Like, are people happy with what they're doing? You know, are these extra clicks just like so cumbersome that they're not going to do it? Like, is that so much extra work? And, you know, if we look at it from a really binary scale, I think sometimes people, you know, sellers and the people that you're serving get lost in the process. Um, and so I think for a lot of this, it's, you know, what are we doing to make it better? How can we do that? And so getting into it and kind of jumping into the, um, the aspect of it is like, it's, it's hard at first, you know, to say, okay, I'm not going to make any recommendations from the get go. And um, I'm just starting now to think, okay, I have a, a bit of a foundation to understand how do I move forward and how do I make these recommendations and how do I say, okay, this is what we're going to prioritize. But I think it's, you know, very fair to the people that have worked there for years to say, okay, you guys know so much more than I do. Um, I need you to tell me like what your problems are. Give me the whole event session. Like, just let me know everything that you need um, because then it can help me understand like what the, what the problems are, what the root causes are and really just what I can do to help because I'm not in a position right now to say, okay, this is what we're doing. We're taking charge and going to be making those changes right now. Mm, I love that phrase of a listening tour. Yeah. yeah it's fantastic. That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> but one. Not me. I'm, I totally I stole it. So, but I, I love the idea, but I think it's great. Yeah, it's a great idea. Absolutely. So, okay, you're right. The human element is really important. So, when we think about the key influences or the champions involved in a process change, how do you get them involved? What does it look like? And how does that help? Yeah. So, I um, in the past, so like part of my background is that um, at my previous job um, at Inmar, I did a lot of work with our mergers and acquisitions. And so bringing folks on from like the companies we acquired, which I think during my tenure was something like 10 different companies, like maybe up to 12. So it was a lot of different organizations. Um, and I think that really taught me how to streamline a lot of those processes and to make sure that, okay, there are people that are involved in this. We need to make sure that everyone that needs to be is like a critical piece of this is included, but there, there are going to be some like key people that are involved in those companies that are going to be like our main champions or our main folks like our super users. Um, and but we need to make sure that everyone's included. And so what I try to do is make sure that we have the right people included when I'm like still giving recommendations for something because I never want to go to a group and say, OK, here's exactly what we're doing. You guys didn't know this was coming. You didn't have a say in it. This is just what's being forced on you. Um, and I think making sure that the people that are that are critical to that process are involved um, from the get go, but that also everyone's like in the loop. Um, and so something I've done in the past through all those those M&A um, projects has been like these like day in the life sessions, essentially, where you just like sit down with different folks, um, make sure that like I understand, like, what do you actually do every day? Because you and I sitting down a meeting with, you know, a dozen other people, I don't fully understand like what your job as, you know, like an AE is or as like a high touch seller or as a renewals expert. Like, I don't know exactly what it is that you do on a regular basis. And honestly, it's, it's hard to articulate it sometimes, especially if you're a seller, like some things are just so innate that I might not be thinking of those issues. Um, and so making sure that I sit down with folks and say, okay, like, can you walk me through the process of what you do? Just like show me your screen, like, you know, in Zoom world, just like put it up on a screen, like pretend you're doing a project or something, or you're, you know, adding a new client or whatever it is, just like show me what you do. Um, and that to me, I find is really helpful in being able to one, make sure that people are understood and that I understand what they're saying because miscommunication, especially in technology with sometimes not the most tech savvy of people and you know myself included are, um, it's hard, like it's hard. And I think things often just get kind of muddied because, you know, you're like, oh, I click on that button. It's like, well, 
what is that? Like, what are are we on different pages? Like, are we talking two different languages here? Like, what's happening? Um, but yeah, I think just making sure that people feel understood and honestly, just like I understand what they're doing too, and and you know, full I full <laughs> that full process of okay, what's the end to end here? And then how can we go from there? And how can I make sure that whatever changes that we implement that you as like the seller are also very happy with them? Mm, okay. It's almost like to align people around a process, we need to align ourselves around what those people do first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's really cool. Um, so, you know, when we think about long-term adoption here, um, what's the cadence for that? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's tough. I think change can be very challenging and it's, um, you know, coming from Inmar, we had about 5,000 employees. It was tough to make people move and to do that quickly, um, especially when, you know, from an operational perspective, like we have a, a new tool that we're going to be using, for example, say our licenses expire in, you know, like several weeks, we need to make sure that we have the right people on board. Um, I find and the, the projects I think that have been most successful are, are kind of in twofold. Um, one, making sure that their management is on board and that they are fully understanding of what the process is and, and why we're doing something too. Um, and I think that to me has always been a big thing of like, I always ask why and like, why, like, what's the point? Like, okay, we're changing this, but is it just that it was too expensive or, you know, did it not work for everybody? Like, what's the, the purpose behind it? Um, and then also making sure that we have a few key folks that are included on the team that we would consider those like super users. Um, for their specific team so that, you know, if you have a team of 10 people and two or three of those folks were involved in those like really initial like in-depth trainings, they can then go and be advocates to the rest of their team where they have someone on their team to ask questions to. Um, and that usually then one takes away for some of the, the influx of questions for like the sales operations group. Um, and two, I think just makes people more comfortable to ask questions and feel less frustrated if they know someone personally on their team that's doing their exact same job that's been able to get it and better understand it. Um, and I, so at, at my time at Inmar, um, what I like to do is like have those couple steps. And then I had just like this, like one page, like white pager of like, okay, here's what the change is, like the change, you know, and then highlight that and say, this is what it is in like a sentence. Um, here's why we're doing it. Here are like the resources. Here's all the training information, but keep it really condensed. And so it was just like one email that could go out, you know, a couple different times and like, Hey, here's the two minutes that you have to read for this, just so you understand the really high level. And even if it doesn't pertain to you initially, like if you're a manager and this isn't something you're going to be using, or if you just need to know for your team, you have that basic information. And I think making sure that everybody that should, should know that has at least like a basic level of understanding of what we're doing with that project is going to help that longer term adoption um, to make sure that like, if you don't understand it and you don't know why we're doing something, I find that people are more often than not just going to omit it and say, okay, well, we don't need to like focus on this. It doesn't include us. Um, and yeah, I mean, but that's not to say that it's not hard. I mean, I think people are, people are tricky with change. And when you like something and you don't understand it, like it's hard to get people to move on it. Um, you know, myself included, like if I was being told to change something, like it's just as tough, it's not super fun. Um, and so I think, again, you know, I keep saying, but like the human aspect of it, of making sure people understand like why we're doing this, but also they're comfortable with it. Like some people are, you know, maybe aren't as, don't feel as comfortable in like different technology environments and giving those people, I think, extra help during that process is something that's like critical to making sure that they understand it and that, you know, everyone around them is also comfortable too. Yeah, great, great. I want to go to this question of why. Um, you know, so far, what I've understood is when, you, at least when you first enter an organization, it's about the information gathering. And you said earlier, you know, what's the problem? But I suppose sometimes there's a problem that people tell us, and then there's maybe the underlying problem. They might not even know what that is, especially if they don't have an operation skill set. Um, so when do you start bridging into the real why? Why? And how do you start bridging into the real why and sometimes maybe even pushing back perhaps yeah i mean that is is kind of like my bread and butter and i think a lot of the m a work has really trained me for that because oftentimes you have folks that like their company was just acquired they're being pulled into all these different meetings and they're saying okay you just need to like, you know, move our Salesforce and that they think that that's largely what it is. And sometimes you have people that, you know, maybe their like Salesforce admin left, or maybe their operations team was just like one person that was doing 10 other different things, or they have a VP that's, you know, not super involved in the process, but is going to be like the main point of contact for the integration. And that's fine. But I think to your point, it's, it's challenging when 
you need to make sure you understand like, okay, what's the cause of this? Like, yes, this, you know, this one process is like really broken. Um, but like, how do we fix that? And I'm a huge advocate against like using band-aid band -aid solutions for things. Like it drives me crazy. And I know, you know, to a point, like you have to patch up the boat, you know, when you really need to. And when it's, things are going underwater, you just need to fix something. Um, but I, I like to take a look and really review like one, like the technical debt that a company may have occurred over time um, and better understand, okay, like, were some of these things that we either chose not to do or that we've been just kind of like fixing on the process are they causing downstream issues um and then two if there's less of that which is sometimes rare but um making sure that i understand like you know kind of like those reviewing sessions like day in the life sessions of what are you actually doing that's causing the problem because oftentimes it's not necessarily what we say it is because it's like, okay, I'm clicking a button and I can't save this page or I'm using this process and it's not uploading my leads the proper way into this tool or whatever it is. Um, but it's it's something that's like different. It's something in the back end of it. And I love like tinkering with that stuff and trying to figure it out and just, you know, running into the system and figuring like, what's, what's the problem here? Like, how can I try to make this better? Um, but I definitely think that there's, it takes an extra level of going into that. Um, and sometimes, honestly, the people that you're talking to don't know the why. They don't know why something's happening. And so I usually take like a round into my own hands. We'll talk to other people that are, um, you know, like at Inmore that were on my team that were, you know, far more knowledgeable about what we were doing than I was and just had an idea of like, okay, do we know how we have this before? Like, is this a common issue? If not, what can we do? Can we just like dive in and try to see if we can replicate it ourselves? Um, can we try to do the same thing? And then, okay, if I were in their position, how do I go back and fix that and make sure that I don't have that happen again? Um, so there are a lot of different little pieces there, but I think it's, you know, it, it really is like a, um, a, a method where you have to go in and try a bunch of different things because it's, it's not just like, tell me why something happens and someone's going to tell you because oftentimes people don't know. And it's yeah. at no fault of anyone um, because that's not their job to know. Like it's my job to figure it out. And it's honestly kind of fun to figure it out. You know, like I like just going into it and going into the weeds and saying, okay, let's try to make this problem happen again. And then how would I solve it if it just happened to me? Yeah, true. Very true. I mean, at the crux of that, Megan, is like reactivity versus proactivity. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's always going to be a balance of both and ops, but lots of folks talk about the challenge of being proactive, and it's because of it, much of the stuff you just said there. So what, what are your brief thoughts on it, how to achieve it, um, you know, how to, how to get to the proactive and, and not always be reactive? Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's, um, first of all, it's tough. I think it is very tough to one to do it yourself, but also to articulate to other people like what it means to to get ahead of things. Because I think as as humans and as a society, we are so prone to excuse me, <coughs> sorry, um, we are so prone to seeing what's in front of us and not really thinking those steps ahead. And honestly, I mean, especially in the past like year in our remote world, like things are so unusual that it's it's weird for people to I think look a little bit ahead. It's usually like what's in front of you, and then what have we either messed up or not fixed in the past and how do we you know move past that um and so i think that there's there's a, a challenge of one from like yourself like starting to think that way because it is like a different mindset of like okay if we do this what is this going to affect downstream of like current processes but also with the projects that we have planned like how is that going to impact them like are we just making you know november of 2021 harder for us because we have this big project that's supposed to roll out then um is it going to make lives you know really challenging because we are doing this process right now or whatever it ends up being um and so i think part of that is just like having a, a plan for your year and your goals and you know, from like a, a really macro perspective of like, okay, what are the three big things I want to accomplish this year? My department wants to accomplish this year. And then from there, I think you can say, okay, with A, B, and C of what I'd like to do, how do I make sure that what I'm doing over the course of the year does not directly contradict those goals that I have? And it sounds very silly, you know, to say, okay, like I obviously wouldn't be working on something that's contradicting something that I'm, I'm planning on doing and that's an accomplishment. Um, 
but I, I mean, there's so many projects that I've worked on that, you know, we do something and say, okay, this is how it's going to be right now. It's going to cause a lot of work in the future. And maybe we can't get to one of those pri like priorities because we just like have to fix this other work. Um, you know, and it's like all kind of in vague terms right now, but it's, um, it's tough. I think it's tough to think ahead and to plan, but it, it just, thinking about it from a high level perspective and saying, what do I want to accomplish over the next X time period? What are the smaller goals that get me there? And then making sure that what you're doing at that time is, you know, productive towards that. Yeah, yeah great. You know, just, just plotting out the year, really good point. Um, final question for you, Megan. If you're in a room full of sales and RevOps heroes, what would you ask them? Ooh, um, that's a good question. I like that question. Um, I would probably, okay, I'd ask them two questions. I think the professional side of me would say, what is, like, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face? And like, what do you do to fix them? You know, like just trying to understand what other companies resolve, um, what they, I mean, honestly, what they face on a regular basis. Like I'm assuming that, you know, we at Concord have similar challenges, other things that we've gotten right that other companies are still working on and the, that kind of knowledge share. Um, I think the other, the, you know, inquisitive side of my brain is, would want to ask, like, what are some of the craziest things you've seen? And like, how did you fix them? Like, what is that one, you know, project that you were just like banging your head against a wall and wanted to say, you know, how do we fix this? Like, what do we do? And that you couldn't figure out. And then you just have that like aha moment. And you're like, oh, that's, that's the way that's what we have to do. Um, because I think that those are so cool. And like, they happen, I think, to everybody, you know, like everyone has those like brilliant strokes where you feel like this is what I have to do, like this is the solution. Um, and I think it's really cool hearing from other people like what they what they've done that's been like to them is the most impressive. Um, and that big problem that they were able to fix from, you know, their years of experience and their teamwork and things like that um, would be really interesting to hear about.